then from 7 to 8, a Bible study, an old-fashioned Bible study of 1 Peter. There is, I put some study guides of the first lesson on the table in the Oasis room, and they have about 10 to 14 more on the front pew. You will see in our 50 minutes together, and this is all the topics we want to cover uh, Tuesday night. There is a sign-up sheet on the podium right by the offering plate. Please sign up if you're planning to come Tuesday night. And they just like to know kind of the amount. To me, an ideal, and we will meet, I'll be down there, and you'll be sitting on this staff, an ideal Bible study is where all of you come, and I will, I will introduce the book, I mean just the chapter and the topics are all written out, and then in each one we have a brief group discussion. Or I could simply tape it. I, I shared, I recently went to one offered to Myerstown Seminary in a church, and the person got up and lectured an hour, and the heat was very high. It was very hard to stay awake. But um, in other words, please take uh, your favorite version of the New Testament and read First Peter. It's, it's considered one of the, the loveliest books in the New Testament. Uh, and bring along your study Bible, commentary, an interlinear, or whatever you want to bring, and we will have a, a group learning on that topic, and all of you, I hope, will want to share. And again, please don't forget the meal. And the reason I do this in March, for years, I've tried this in April. In April, people want to get out to their lawns. Uh, it's just, um, it's light out, and so I've learned the hard way. I know this is hard for people who don't drive at night. Hopefully you can team up with other folks who do. So please remember to sign up. And the meal this Tuesday night is Charles Cook's homemade vegetable soup. And then a week from this Tuesday night, Lynn Keller is making spaghetti. So it is more than a Bible study. It's truly a time of fellowship. A few weeks ago, the East Calico Lions Club visited with us. They wrote a whole letter back of what a meaningful time they had how much they enjoyed all of you, and the style of worship fit them, frankly. And we even had a nice big cake for them to have and enjoy. So uh, thank God for that. I should write him back and say, why don't you just make us your home church and be done with it, right? <laughs> and we would love that. They're all about our age and fit in very I'll write, well. I'll write them. Can hear you. All right, I think that's all the announcements. At this time, we will quiet our hearts uh, for the prelude. <laughs> Yeah.
in a number of times and ways at our church, we have talked about the author, the great author, Henry Nowen. We'll turn to invitation number 19 in our hymnal, and we will pray this invocation in unison. I really had the privilege of spending a long weekend at the Trappist Monastery where he was for years, and it was beautiful, and you spend the weekend in silence except for some teaching sessions. Let's begin. Those who think that they have arrived have lost their way. Those who think they have reached their goal have missed it. Those who think they are saints are demons. An important part of the spiritual life is to keep longing, waiting, hoping, expecting. In the long run, some voluntary penance becomes necessary to help us remember that we are not yet fulfilled. A good criticism, a frustrating day, an empty stomach, or tired eyes might help to reawaken our expectations and deepen our prayer, come, Lord Jesus, come. And please rise for our opening hand. <laughs> Charlie is a kid at school. He's bigger than the rest of us. So 
that we like to pick on the kids that are smaller. So what happened? I see you got a black eye. He started calling me names. So because he called you a name, he got into a fight? Wait till mom sees you. I got tired of him picking on me, so I thought maybe if I fought back, he would stop. Mom always told me that you should avoid fights because they won't solve anything. Well, I got tired of Charlie calling my, me names. Remember the bracelet they gave us in Sunday school? It said, what would Jesus do? Yeah, so? So think about it. What would Jesus do? He knows that is. He knows what it's like to be picked on. And he knows what it's like to be called names. Look, little sister, this is different. How is it different? You were picked on. You were called names. Jesus went through the same thing. You know, for once in your life, you're right. The Bible teaches us that Jesus didn't get angry. He prayed for those who hurt him. Are you telling me I should pray for Charlie? <coughs> yeah, and pray that your black eye disappears before you get home. It's not going to be easy to pray for Charlie. The Bible says, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. And it looks like he got hurt. Charlie's words did hurt me, but I only hurt myself by getting into a fight. We did not have to deal with mom and dad. So what are you going to do? I'm going to pray for Charlie and pray for myself so that I won't get angry and fight again. I'm going to say a prayer too. What are you going to pray about? I'm going to pray for you so that mom and dad don't punish you too much for fighting at school. Facing them is worse than facing Charlie. Come on, let's go home. Rocky. Very funny, little sis. <laughs> We come to our time now of uh, sharing our joys and concerns. I did want to ask, do any of you uh, know where Ron Kreider is? Oh, yes. Yeah, Lynchburg. He's in Lynchburg, Virginia. They, Randy, two boys are playing against each other, pitching against each other in that baseball game. That's good to know. Ron Kreider is on vacation in Lynchburg, Virginia. The reason I asked is yesterday he wasn't in men's group, and today he wasn't here, and that is so unlike Ron. Uh, Ron, if you're listening, enjoy yourself and behave. <laughs> we certainly want to remember Louise's two adult sons who are dealing with cancer. We want to remember Brett's brother, and thank you for those of you who have sent a card of encouragement to him. And Brett has another friend who has a serious health concern we want to remember. We remember <coughs> Kathy Stoltzfus, who is finishing her first major round of chemo for uh, cancer of the throat. Without the treatment, she was given uh, three to six months. With it, she's given one to two years. Remember Kathy Stoltz, who's out at a, uh, a place in Colorado being treated. We certainly want, we want to remember and pray for the end of the war in Ukraine. On the Church of the Brethren National website, uh, they listed one church that had just built a warm and close relationship with the local church there. And the, the local church is deeply struggling. And, and terrified, and shared that with all of our churches. Any other now prayer concerns, updates? Yes, Wendy. Um, I have a prayer <coughs> concern for my grandfather. He was taken to the hospital this morning um, with trouble breathing, uh, so uh, we think it's his fluid again filling up, so that's kind of all I know at this point. Since that was just this morning, like five ten. How old is it? Ninety-three. Ninety-three. Oh, you know, until he was moved to Brethren Village, he was coming to our Saturday mornings men's group on a regular basis, living in his own home, driving his own vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, the whole thing. We had we we called him Iron Man, <laughs> but but remember Ed, he's he's failing and having. Uh, fluid on the lungs, etc. Dear soul, and a man so in love with Jesus yes, and has so much joy in knowing Jesus. Yes. 
lived an interesting life. Any others? All right, we will turn in our red hymnal to our prayer song 556. Just singing it once.
continue asking some of the greatest questions of Scripture. And today we turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and read the first eight verses. Some of the most powerful and astounding word pictures we can ever read. A picture of God in His glory in heaven. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were two seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and here's our great question, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here, I, here am I, send me. About 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the sad announcement was made that the beloved King Uzziah is dead. He was the 11th king of Judah, and he and Isaiah were very close personal friends. And Isaiah was crushed. Uzziah was crowned at age 16, and he reigned 52 years and died at age 68. Isaiah fled to the temple and looked up to God for help, and there he had a vision. There he saw another king, the ultimate king of glory. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. At his side were angels, whose job was to give glory to God. They shielded their eyes from the direct gaze of God himself. Out of reverence and out of awe for God. When Isaiah was crushed, he worshipped God. When he felt the deepest loss, he turned to God and made we do the same. When Isaiah turned to God, he received a God-sized vision of life. And you know, true worship will always move our heart. And it will move our hearts to the extent that we take some action. In this scene, the glory of God shook the foundations of the temple. Isaiah realized his sinfulness in the presence of God. And God then touched Isaiah's lips. And may God touch all of our lips, starting with these two as well, on a daily basis. If our confession of God is negative and faithless, our vision and calling will be warped and powerless. A God-sized vision will move us to say, Here I am. Send me, God. 
You know, God uses circumstances to get our attention. It was a time of loss and a time of extreme grief for Isaiah. This sudden passing left him shocked and almost hopeless. Everything in Isaiah's world felt like it was in confusion. The king was dead, the nation was in peril, and Isaiah could do nothing to change this. Because his earthly circumstances got so bad, he looked upward. And you notice what the Lord in heaven was doing? God was sitting down. God is totally in control in that moment and in this moment. The invasion in Ukraine was no surprise to God, and frankly, not too much of the rest of the world. God is not sitting in heaven, wringing his hands, wondering, what am I going to do now that Uzziah is gone? What am I going to do about the tensions in the Middle East? God is not worried about what is coming next, and neither should we be. God gets, a God gets our attention so that we can be aware of his presence. God reveals his character to make us see our need. Not the, not the needs of others, but God wants us to look at our needs when we get a glimpse of his glory. Isaiah saw God in this vision and thought, Who am I that I should even be seeing this? And that was true worship when you say, Oh, who am I that, I, that God would even recognize me? We are so worried about our circumstances and, I, and at our beginnings that we forget what God is going to do with us in the long term. Remember, if you look at these beginnings, you would never believe the outcomes. Adam was a failure. Noah was a drunk. Abram was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses was a stutterer. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was a murderer and, and had an affair. Elijah was suicidal. And here's the worst one, unbearable. Isaiah was made to preach naked. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, Lord help us all. That, that puts the fear in me. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ. The disciples all fell asleep and ultimately deserted Christ when he needed them most. Mary Magdalene was clearly demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman had lived with many men. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus was frankly dead. What do we need to surrender to God this morning? God gives us hope so that we will be useful to him in the future. God, could have, God can reach people any way he wants to, yet he always chooses everyday people like you and me who have problems to work through. Matter of fact, and this was, I'd say now, maybe 20 years ago, we were traveling to Maine, and I was listening on CD, a seminar of two of the greatest pastors of large churches in America, and their philosophy was exactly different. The one pastor wanted for his church the most excellent and overachieving staff to work for the church, and I understand the best of that. The other pastor, who was Rick Warren, would only hire people who had in some way been totally broken in life. And then God had in time put their lives together. And of course, they offered excellence. 
Out of the two pastors, uh, the one who focused only on perfection has burned out and was chased out, and Rick Warren is still in the pulpit today. Uh, just And I just thought that was very interesting. He says, if, if I don't have people, including himself, and his wife who had cancer, and his son who committed suicide, if I don't really deal with brokenness mm -hmm. and think too much of myself, I fear what's going to happen to them, the church. Mm -hmm. Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector of England. During his battles with Charles I, a problem occurred. They had run out of silver to fund the war against Charles I. Cromwell made an order and said, okay, let's go throughout all of England and gather all the silver that's left. And the only silver that was left was in the statues in the churches. So Cromwell said, in this case, we'll melt down the saints and put them into circulation. <laughs> and isn't that what God is doing with you and I? In our Sunday school lesson, uh, we listened to a video of a speaker, and we're going to kind of really reflect on it next Sunday. He said, we're all on a need-to-know basis. We are all, starting with me, dealing with stuff this week that others knew about 20 years ago. But we are only to the place where we can deal with it now, where God can touch us. And, and God only knows what it is, but we are going from grace to grace. You know, people often say uh, the church has taken 20 centuries and hasn't quite reached the whole world. We're in the space of about one century. Almost everyone in the world has heard of Coca-Cola. A large percentage has tasted it, and etc. How effective some companies have been, even compared to the church. God expands our vision to make us evaluate our availability to him. Finally, Isaiah was looking at life through God's lens. In conclusion this morning, have you seen the glory and the power of God lately? I'll say for myself, not near enough. <laughs> I've seen a lot of news. I've uh, seen a lot of drama, but the glory and power of God. Sometimes I open the book of Revelation, and it's a group just like us. You know what we do? We come into the room, and there's no peace. We fall down on our, on our faces and be, begin laughing and crying because God has entered. And I remind myself, that's my future. That's your future. That type of experience of fullness of God. I hope we look and find the glory and power of God. What, whatever God is shaking in your life and in my life, whatever we're sad about, those are issues and callings from God to help us to press forward in new grace. What are our lips speaking? And all of us know, and it's so painful to be human, and the fact that the tongue is wild. No one can control the tongue. And remember, uh, about a year ago, Doug said one time in a group lesson here, I said, who is the disciplined person? Doug A. said, the person who can reasonably control his tongue. And we all got quiet. Isn't it true? And it's, you know, there are a lot of thoughts going in and out of your mind. But God asks us to rein it in. Because a lot of that isn't worth sharing. Do you have a bold vision for the moving of God in this church and in America for 2022? Or are you hiding in fear? Are you living in fear of the pandemic? You know, the church handled the last two years of, of this pandemic exactly the opposite the way the church did in the 8300, and many of them died. But wherever there was a church, in the cities of Asia Minor, throughout the Roman Empire, the population did better. The church went out and gave food and care. They tried to keep 
as much as they knew, trying to stay safe, but reached out to the unchurched <coughs> and the needy. And, and the survival rate was much higher when the church was involved. So much of the church today has just given in to fear. And they say, close the church. Can you imagine God in this scene and all of this glory looking down? And people saying, yep, we're just going to close the church and we'll all hide at home and spray disinfectant. I'm not saying that people aren't going to die and, and, have, to, and have died from the pandemic. But, pe but we all are going to die, you know, ultimately. But we are not going to be fear-based. Are you living in fear of this pandemic or perhaps the next one? Are you living in fear of getting sick or older? Something we're all going to do. Are you living in fear of the war or political trends in our country? None of this is a surprise to God, and he's sitting on the throne and occasionally yawns at the human drama this stirs up. Are you living in fear of leaving your rut? That would be more me. Are you, do you fear leaving your quiet, safe, and unchallenged faith? Now that can stir me up, and I think it should. God in all his glory is watching his church today. What is your grand vision for God to do in East Cocalico Church and in our community? What is God's powerful calling for this church? What is God calling you to step up, to speak out, and to do? Can you say, God, I get it. You're speaking through the hurts of my life. Here I am. I'm stepping out for you. Can you sing? Take my life and let it be consecrated to you. Our closing hymn, number 380.
to step back, to give in to fear, and to stay in our ruts. We are so tempted to stay in our quiet, safe, and unchallenged life. Move us, God. <clears throat> Send us. Use us. Because that's why you created and placed us here in the first place. Dismiss us in your care and grace. Bless our time of fellowship and food to follow downstairs, we pray. Amen.